Hi, I'm uh, Rob Mickey. I teach American politics at the University of Michigan. Um, it's an honor for me to chair this panel to browbeat such a distinguished group of scholars. Um, we're going to be discussing, as Richard Neustadt termed it, separate institutions sharing power. Um, consider how well the branches are interacting with each other now. Um, think about benchmarks that we could use to help us evaluate the current period and so on. Um, each speaker will get no more than 10 minutes, but I don't have an alarm. Um, and then uh, we'll turn things, over to, <laughs> turn things over to Ken Roberts. I just want to quickly introduce all of them at once so you don't have to keep seeing me. So our first presenter will be Francis Lee, professor of government at the University of Maryland and uh, author most recently of Insecure Majorities, Congress and the Perceptual Campaign. She'll be talking about Congress, of course. The next is Keith Whittington, professor of politics at Princeton and author of the just published book, Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech. He'll be discussing Trump and the judiciary. Um, third is John Giulio, professor of politics, religion, and civil society, and of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he'll be drawing on his recent book, Bring Back the Bureaucrats, and discussing the, the federal state apparatus. And then finally, uh, Sid Milkus, professor of politics at UVA, um, and author of the forthcoming book, uh, Rivalry and Reform, Presidents, Social Movements, and Democratic Change. Um, and you've already met Ken Roberts, so I'm not going to introduce him. All right, so turn things over to Francis. My mandate uh, is to address how well the current Congress is performing its role in the separation of powers regime, whether it's maintaining its autonomy from the White House and how well it's performing a check on uh, executive authority through oversight and other means. In my memo, I argue that Congress has continued to perform its traditional role of checking presidents and preventing concentration of power in the executive branch. Where I argue Congress has fallen short is less in its checking capacity than in its positive policy development capacities. The 115th Congress has struggled in conflict resolution and policy legitimation. Despite unified control, Congress has been a site of opposition to presidential authority. Even though Republicans have maintained extraordinarily unified ranks on roll call votes, the 115th Congress has checked the Trump administration in legislation, appointments, oversight, and via public criticism. On legislation, conflict between Congress and the Trump administration has been tacit but continuous. Republicans quietly treated the administration's budget proposals in both 2017 and 2018 as dead on arrival. The two-year spending deal that Congress just agreed to uh, th this year bore little resemblance to the president's budget, substantially increased rather than cut domestic discretionary spending. Congressional Republicans have taken no interest in acting on a range of issues central to Trump's presidential campaign, including infrastructure and immigration. Generally speaking, the only legislative priorities on which Congress has acted have been those where Trump's preferences dovetailed with longstanding Republican Party orthodoxy. Even on those issues, however, Congress was not always able to deliver. The administration's highest profile legislative drive, the repeal and replacement of Obamacare, failed. The major legislative achievement of the 115th Congress, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, enacted a long-standing Republican wish list of tax cuts for corporations and individuals. It's hard to credit Trump with the achievement, as similar legislation would have almost certainly passed under any Republican president elected in 2016. Congress would probably have reversed a large number of Obama-era agency rules under any other Republican president as well. The implication is that Congress is pursuing its own preferences in legislation, not taking presidential direction. On appointments, congressional influence has not taken the form of Congress voting down presidential nominees, but Congress has nevertheless restricted the president's autonomy. Congressional scrutiny and media investigation has led to 41 executive branch uh, nominees being withdrawn thus far in the 115th Congress, a markedly higher number than the 16 withdrawn nominations in the 111th Congress, the last episode of unified party control. <clears throat> 
uh, President Trump has been able to install more extreme and less conventionally qualified appointees as a consequence of a shift in Senate procedure that permits simple majority cloture on executive branch nominations. But this procedural change would have strengthened any president's hand in unified government, and it does not imply that Republican senators, senators have shown special deference to Trump. The president has only filled 56 percent of Senate confirmable positions, a rate more than 30 percent slower than the average for the past four presidents at the same point in their terms. Among Trump's successful nominations is a relative dearth of appointees with distinctively Trumpist profiles. Most Senate-confirmed Trump appointees possess mainstream Republican credentials uh, and espouse few unorthodox policy stances. On oversight, the Republican Congress has come in for a significant amount of criticism. Despite Republicans' disinclination to investigate the Trump administration, however, congressional oversight has nevertheless broken news and generated media coverage unfavorable to the administration. Unquestionably, a Congress controlled by Democrats would have been more aggressive in pursuing a wider range of investigations. Nevertheless, the 115th Congress has still held investigatory hearings that have caused damaging political fallout for the Trump administration. Less than three months into the Trump presidency, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees had launched formal inquiries into Russian involvement in the 2016 elections and possible collusion with the Trump presidential campaign. And after the president uh, fired FBI Director Comey, the Senate Judiciary Committee opened a third formal inquiry. These congressional probes have been potent drivers of news coverage. All the broadcast networks interrupted their regular daytime programming to carry Comey's testimony before the Senate Intelligence Committee. While these, two of these investigations have gotten bogged down in partisan infighting, even news coverage about partisan wrangling on a committee keeps the issues uh, in, uh, in the public eye. Ranking member Adam Schiff has become a household name. Once these investigations were launched, it was not possible even for loyal committee, Trump loyal committee chairs to fully control the news that emerged from them. In assessing the 115th Congress's role in executive oversight, the most troubling development has been the efforts of Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee to discredit the FBI and the Mueller investigation. These actions raise the, raise the prospect that congressional Republicans will side with Trump should he choose to close down the Mueller investigation. But the bottom line is that a unified government has afforded the Trump administration protection against co congressional oversight, but it has not fully insulated the president from damaging congressional investigations. With regard to public criticism, even though most Republican members of Congress have steered clear of publicly criticizing President Trump, intra-party congressional criticism of Trump has been highly visible throughout his presidency today. No moderately attentive follower of public affairs could have missed the news that Senator Bob Corker had claimed that the White House had become an adult daycare center. On numerous occasions when Trump has made controversial remarks, such as following the neo-Nazi protests in Charlottesville, journalists have taken it upon themselves to track down comments from every member of Congress willing to give a statement. Critical comments from Republicans typically lead in such news stories, Often striking in these controversies is the relative paucity of Republicans willing to publicly defend the president. So Congress's capacity to check executive power seems undiminished relative to contemporary norms for unified government. But the 115th Congress has shown limited capacity for conflict resolution and policy legitimation. One of Congress's remarkable strengths as a political institution is its long-standing tendency to legislate on the basis of broad bipartisan coalitions uh, encompassing majorities of both parties. Despite the rise of party polarization in Congress, this pattern has not faded in recent years. The legislation that passes does not take the, today does not increasingly look more like the Affordable Care Act. Important legislation still usually passes with significant support from both parties. The 115th Congress, however, has largely attempted to proceed with major legislation on the basis of Republican-only majorities. With the exception of the Russian Sanctions Act, which passed with nearly unanimous support, all the major legislation of 2017 was enacted on party-line votes. 
by far the most important of that legislation um, was, uh, of, of the enacted legislation was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which, which sharply and permanently lowered tax rates for corporations, dramatically reduced taxation of foreign profits of, of U.S. companies, limited and eliminated many tax deductions for individuals while raising the standard deduction. It also opened the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to oil and natural gas drilling and abolished the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate. These major, these major policies were adopted without any votes from Democrats in either chamber. But reviewing the record of the 115th Congress to date, what's most striking is how little legislation has passed. Of the plans outlined in House Speaker Paul Ryan's ambitious Better Way agenda, few saw any form of legislative action and only tax reform was enacted despite unified Republican control. Now that tax reform has passed, Republicans have not achieved any intra-party consensus on what agenda item to pursue next. The 2018 omnibus appropriation is likely the last major legislation that will pass before the midterm elections. So taken together, the 115th Congress has served as an important check on presidential power, but it's also an institution struggling with conflict resolution. Congress has demonstrated uh, limited ability to resolve policy disputes via bipartisan coalition. At the same time, the majority party has only shown limited capacity to go it alone. The Republican Party's internal consensus seems not to extend much beyond tax cuts and deregulation. It's not easy to suggest institutional reforms that would enable Congress to better serve its functions. One modest reform Congress might consider to bolster its capabilities to check executive power would be to revisit the Federal Vacancies Reform Act of 1998, governing the temporary filling of executive branch offices requiring Senate confirmation. The Trump administration's difficulties identifying Senate confirmable appointees has led to an extreme reliance on acting officers throughout the federal bureaucracy. The administration is, uh, as such, testing statutory limits on allocating power to officials who have not been Senate confirmed. So there's no institutional remedy to Congress's struggles with policy legitimation. But in the wake of the 2016 elections, Congress could also consider what it could do to strengthen public confidence in the, outcome, uh, in the outcomes of uh, U.S. elections. All right, so um, I'm supposed to talk about um, Trump and the federal judiciary, um, and I want to mostly follow the structure of my brief and break it into three parts. Um, a little bit about sort of the nature of courts and what they can do as checks on a president in general, um, a bit on the kind of particular um, litigation and issues in the judiciary facing the Trump administration, and then a final bit about some of the unique features of the Trump administration and its approach to the courts. Um, so first, in thinking broadly about courts as an available check, um, on presidents and how they fit into the general um, constitutional scheme, I think it's worth bearing three um, uh, basic points in mind. Um, one of which is that um, uh, some of what we're worried about relative to the Trump administration really falls outside the purview of what we would expect um, courts to be able to help with um, at all. That is, to the extent we're worried about Trump's um, challenge to uh, political and constitutional norms more generally, as opposed to his policy making as such, there's relatively little that courts um, can come um, to the assistance of the constitutional system to do. It's led us to think more as academics about the importance of constitutional norms and informal features of the constitutional system, but those are also features of the constitutional system um, that courts have uh, relatively little um, to say. Secondly, is how interested are courts um, in the capacity to defend um, judiciary? And here I would point to um, the set of doctrines um, that the courts have developed over time that tends to be highly deferential um, to the executive branch and to the president, in particular across a whole range of policy issues. Some of those tie to the, how the co court understands uh, the Constitution and the president's constitutional powers under Article II, especially uh, in the realm of things that may be loosely characterized um, as foreign policy, and here the court over the last century um, has developed a very deferential set of doctrines um, that Trump can take advantage of and has been taking advantage of. But in addition, the, the courts have been fairly deferential to the kind of statutory authority um, the presidents and the executive branch um, also draw upon. And here, the, the Trump benefits not only from the court's own deferential attitude uh, in interpreting um, uh, how they, uh, how the, what those statutes mean and how uh, the administration uh, is implementing them, but also benefits from how those statutes are written. Uh, 
um, that Congress has over the course of time delegated lots of authority um, to the president and to the executive branch, has created lots of loosely written um, statutes that authorize presidents to do um, a great deal at their own discretion. Um, and as a consequence, Trump has a lot of legal authority uh, through statutes that he can now take advantage of, as in fact um, is taking advantage of, and we shouldn't necessarily expect the courts um, to pull us out of that problem um, if we don't like how uh, this particular president is using the discretion that the statutes um, have provided to him. Third, we can think about how powerful our courts, how capable are they of constraining the president even if they wanted to, even if they had tiger doctrines and the like. And I'll come back to this in a minute, but it's worth reminding yourselves of the fact that Alexander Hamilton, in trying to sell the Constitution uh, to the American people and those who were skeptical, said that the courts were the least dangerous branch. And part of why he said the courts were the least dangerous branch is precisely because he expected the courts to be very weak. There's relatively little that courts would do, and that's good if you're very concerned about courts, you think they're gonna muck things up. Um, but it's not so good if you're relying on courts to defend you against the president, for example, that you think uh, might be mucking things up. Um, but it's still the case that the courts, in fact, are relatively weak. There's limits to how much power they have, even if they wanted to be more aggressive um, to go um, after the president uh, and, and executive power uh, more generally. So now let's turn briefly to thinking about sort of three buckets of kinds of litigation that's been um, uh, affecting uh, the Trump administration in general. And here I just want to sort of describe the landscape of what it is uh, the courts are thinking about. It's worth think remembering that we're still relatively early in the Trump administration. One thing about courts is they move very slowly. Um, so you should expect litigation to take a long time. There's a lot of up and down uh, within the judicial hierarchy, and the Trump administration is already experiencing that. So one thing that's sort of remarkable about the Trump administration is how quickly, in fact, a lot of litigation has progressed. Um, there, people have been very quick to bring challenges to courts. Courts have been very quick to rule on those challenges uh, relating to the Trump administration. So there's been an extraordinary amount of litigation and judicial activity um, surrounding the Trump administration in a very short period of time uh, compared to what we might normally expect to see. But nonetheless, it's going to take some time for it all to play out. And so we shouldn't think the courts are going to move um, too quickly. Those three buckets of kind of litigation, some of which are kind of unique to the Trump administration and some of which are not particularly unique to, the, to this administration. So to start with the kind that's not particularly unique to this administration, we might think about how executive branch officials are interpreting and implying statutes. This has relatively little to do with the Trump White House, um, but instead we should focus on what uh, the various departments and cabinets and agencies um, are doing, staffed um, by people who in many ways are mainstream uh, Republicans in various ways, so the Trump White House doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with, but they're going about the process of interpreting and applying statutes uh, in various ways. Um, opposition interests have been very aggressive in challenging a lot of those um, regulatory decisions that are being made um, uh, by the administration. Some of that's organized by state attorney generals from the Democratic Party, so some of it's specifically partisan challenges, um, but uh, uh, yeah, interestingly, uh, uh, leveraging federalism and federal inst and state-level institutions in order to challenge um, uh, Trump administration actions, um, but that's sort of proceeding apace in ways that we really we should have expected under any Republican administration. Um, at this point, they'd be facing very similar kinds of legal challenges uh, from their opposition. Another set of challenges, though, are more unique to the Trump administration, and that is challenging things that are specifically emerging out of the White House, in particular executive orders. Here, the most high-profile version being the travel ban, one of the very earliest things the Trump White House does is rolled out very badly, uh, badly prepared um, and written, and as a consequence, has faced um, lots of difficulties uh, in the courts, and litigation has gone back and forth, um, up and down uh, the judicial hierarchy, but also back and forth between the courts and the administration as the White House has tried to rewrite um, that uh, policy in order to, to accommodate uh, some of the objections the courts have made. So courts have been relatively effective in pushing back and delaying and hampering uh, the administration in various ways, often forcing the administration to be responsive uh, to the court's concerns um, as it's moved forward um, on that front. And finally, we might think about things that are personal to Trump. And here we might think about the Mueller investigation, we might think about emoluments uh, litigation that's now um, starting to heat up. Things are very focused on the person, and for that matter, Stormy Daniels. Things are very focused on uh, the individual person of Trump and those immediately surrounding him, rather than public policy as such, whether it's public policy uh, from the larger executive branch or public policy from the president um, himself. And one interesting feature of Trump is we might think that that's the stuff that Trump actually cares about the most. Right? The Trump has relatively few policy things he seems to care about. He doesn't care very much about the Republican Party um, as such. The thing he really cares about um, is himself um, and the Trump uh, business empire. And so to the extent that that kind of personal litigation is much more focused um, on that, to the extent that the courts wind up binding the administration, 
um, and attacking the administration in various ways, uh, that may be the part of the judicial pushback on the Trump administration that Trump himself is likely to care the most about, and as a consequence might be the riskiest uh, in terms of Trump uh, deciding to lash out uh, in relatively dramatic ways. So that brings us finally to the third um, uh, set of concerns, which is to think about um, uh, how Trump himself and the Trump administration has related itself um, to the judiciary. And again, here I'd make uh, three points. Uh, first is thinking about um, uh, Trump's uh, rhetoric relative to the judiciary. So R Trump, even during his political campaign, but since he's been inaugurated as well, um, has been unusually harsh um, in attacking uh, the federal courts uh, in general, sometimes attacking individual judges, attacking the FBI, other legal institutions, attacking his own attorney general uh, in various ways, all of which we might think of as being subversive of the rule of law, subversive of the independent judiciary, subversive of the possibility of legal and judicial checks um, on the administration more generally. We might think it makes those other actors more reluctant uh, to attack Trump, although actually sometimes I think it's likely to be counterproductive. Judges are likely to push back harder precisely because Trump is attacking them. But the other thing it does is potentially rally his own supporters um, behind this view, for example, that the Mueller investigation is illegitimate, that federal judges are behaving badly. Um, and to the extent he's successful in rallying constituents, Republican voters, uh, to that belief, then it might disarm Congress in any, any eventual confrontation uh, between the White House uh, and the court. Second, the thing we might worry about the most is the possibility of the president defying the courts in various ways. So if the courts actually rule against the president, it's the president very likely to simply uh, ignore the courts. And of course, that's always a concern with the president. And we might think it's even more of a concern with Trump himself, given Trump's larger attitude and the fact that he's relatively detached from the political system. We might think he doesn't have the same kind of long-term stakes in the system that other presidents do. I think the thing we ought to bear in mind as well, though, is the Republican Party has long-term stakes in judicial independence in the larger system. So it's a popular meme, for example, that anytime Trump does something badly to say, but Gorsuch, because the Republicans are only going to care about the Gorsuch thing and, and say uh, that the nomination of a Supreme Court justice makes up for all the uh, awful things Trump is doing more generally. But this is also an important reminder that the Republican Party cares about Gorsuch, and they care about justice, and they care about independent judiciary that's relatively authoritative and, and powerful, and that's going to lead them to want to resist court, Trump in various ways if he's undermining the uh, courts. And finally, just to, uh, uh, to say briefly about uh, judicial nominations, Trump, of course, has been very efficient um, at sending nominees to the Senate. The Senate, likewise, has been relatively efficient uh, in confirming those uh, nominations, and as a consequence, there's been quite a few just judges um, appointed to the courts uh, in a relatively short period of time. But for the most part, these aren't specifically Trumpist judges. These are conservative Republican judges that we could have expected out of most any Republican administration. But they aren't necessarily particularly attached to Trump, Trumpian ideas, Trumpian interest as such. Instead, they're interested in the same kinds of things that most Republican and conservative uh, judges would be interested in. And that means, in part, they're interested in providing various kinds of checks on the ability and power of the national government more broadly, and the ability and power of the presidency in particular. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank everyone. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, and, uh, and other great organizers of this event for uh, having me aboard. I'm delighted to be here with this distinguished panel. Um, before I get started, just a an apology, I have to duck out a little bit early. Um, I'm going to be going to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, joining some of my other Penn colleagues for the swearing in of Connor Lamb, uh, that young uh, fellow who, uh, one of our former Penn students. Yes, I, uh, this is a nonpartisan comment. I'm happy as hell uh, that he won. Uh, uh, double happy as hell. So, uh, Trump, the federal bureaucracy, and what I'll call the contractor state. Um, I want to do two things uh, with the time I have, and I will try to keep to those 10 minutes. By God, Drutman's here somewhere back there, and I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> be, be very afraid. Um, I want to talk about what Trump's done and what he hasn't done, and I want to talk about one of the larger issues uh, surrounding federal bureaucracy, if you can call it federal bureaucracy, and the contractor state. So what's he done? So Trump runs, and he sounds, to me at least, uh, during the campaign, very much like other Republican presidential aspirants going back to Ronald Reagan. He bashes federal bureaucrats. He promises to cut waste, fraud, and abuse. He pledges to kill federal agencies. He's going to roll back regulations. He comes in during his first months as president, and he proposes a number of things to drain the swamp uh, and calls for a no freeze, a no exceptions freeze on federal hiring. He's going to eliminate 19 federal agencies. He's going to roll back regulations. 
But by the time you get to his uh, State of the Union address, uh, the rhetoric actually gets ramped up. Now it's a draining the swamp, it's a rigged system. Bureaucrats are defenders of this rigged system. They are denizens of the deep state. Uh, they work to undermine presidential prerogatives and popular wishes. This is harsher rhetoric, I think, even than in other presidential administrations. Um, and he uses executive orders and other means to try to do all the above. What happened? Very briefly, obviously. So my Penn colleague, uh, law school colleague, Carrie Colognese, has argued that during Trump's first year in office with respect to the federal regulations, fewer uh, regulations were actually lifted than most people assumed uh, or had been led to believe. He counts 3,222 new federal regulations that were issued in 2017 compared to about 3,500 that were issued during Barack Obama's first year. And he concludes, quote, uh, overall, the size of the federal government's regulatory agenda remained roughly the same as in 2016. So bad news for especially environmental uh, protection regulations, but not as big an impact, at least according to my good friend, uh, Carrie Colognese, as might be expected. With respect to this hiring freeze, this lasted about 15 minutes. Um, by April 2017, it was publicly walked back by uh, the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, they ran into that other institution at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue uh, that's talked about in Article 1. Uh, with respect to the 19 uh, agencies that were targeted for elimination, they were all alive uh, in the second Trump budget, each and every one of them. I wouldn't say alive and well, because they were all almost all subject to uh, severe funding cuts, but they were still being negotiated. So that's where it stood at the end of 2017. The last three months, or January, February, March, uh, the Trump White House made two, has made, I would say, two rather distinct and I would say flatly contradictory, uh, one to the other, sets of pronouncements and proposals relevant to federal bureaucracy. The first set uh, would seem to be predicated on the idea that if the federal bureaucracy, the workforce, all its works cannot be rolled back or frozen or outright eliminated, then it can and should be radically reorganized and shrunken. And so they come up with this mandate to the federal agencies to more or less surreptitiously reorganize and shrink. Uh, this breaks, of course, into public view, especially the Department of Education. Uh, there is a hue and cry. And again, that other institution at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue is heard from. And in the late, latest omnibus federal budget bill, uh, they expressly block doing this reorganization without plan-specific congressional oversight and approval. So that doesn't mean it's over, uh, but it means that uh, the checks and balances seem to be checking and balancing a bit. Now, that's the first response. Here's the second response, and I don't understand this, okay? This is, this is the uh, copy of the first page of a 48-page report that was issued by the Office of Management and Budget uh, on March 20th, 2018. It's got the scintillating title, President's Management Agenda. Um, and what this uh, report does uh, is seem to be predicated on the premise that the federal bureaucracy is not so big and bad after all. This is the Trump OMB, that the so-called swamp does not really exist as such or need to be drained, and that the character and quality of American democracy depends vitally on improving government performance through bipartisan efforts to modernize, not downsize the federal bureaucracy, to shore up, not shrink, the full-time federal workforce, and to listen to, not lambaste, the career civil servants. Uh, this document is puzzling. <laughs> um, there is almost nothing in this document that seems to me, I, it's, I'll say the harshest thing I can say about it is that I myself could have written it. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> me and any other uh, National Academy of Public Administration geezers uh, would have, would have loved, just, I mean, you just love this stuff. It, it doesn't make sense. Here's one line from it. Federal, this is in it. Federal, so it quotes the president as saying, quote, at all levels of government, our public servants put our country first and our people first. It goes on to say, federal employees underpin nearly all the operations of government, ensuring the smooth functioning of our democracy. While most Americans will never meet the president, they will interact with the federal employees who work in their community in their interest. My goodness. Um, my uh, good colleague and friend, I know many of you know Don Kettle uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Don referred to this in an article he wrote for Government Executive as, quote, a fascinating document, different in virtually every respect from the plans of previous administrations, plans of this administration, a world-class plan for transforming the government and between the lines a powerful diagnostic for what ails us. Okay, well, you know, you pick them. Um, 
I don't think, and I don't think anyone who was shocked by this in a pleasant way, thinks that we should soon be expecting uh, the president to be tweeting sweet words about the federal bureaucracy uh, or such. Um, I think it's probably the exception uh, that proves the, uh, the, the, is the exception to the rule and the rhetoric uh, here. But more importantly, I don't think that we are yet know really how the Trump administration is going to play out with respect to really what I consider to be at least uh, the most important single overarching reality about American federal bureaucracy. And I'm gonna ask now for that first slide to be uh, put up. You've already seen it. It occurred, <laughs> it occurred during Rick, I should put up a picture of Rick Valley instead, just for equal time. Uh, but if I can have the first slide, or do you want me to, no, not that one. The one with the funny, funny lines. Uh, the, no, not that one. Uh, well, anyway, uh, it's a slide about federal contracts. If you find it, let me know. Put it up. Um, it's that one you saw during Valley's presentation, which showed that between 2011 and 2015, the federal government put out $2.5 trillion worth of contracts. $2.5 trillion worth of contracts. So you know the story. We've had roughly the same number of federal bureaucrats, federal civilian workers, since 1965, about 2 million, with no increase whatsoever uh, to the federal civilian workforce, ups and downs a little bit. How did we do that? We did it by the federal government essentially doing proxy administration, three things, sending it out to state and local governments, employment of which soars, many of them de facto feds, nonprofit sector, right? Nonprofit sector, a two point something trillion dollar sector, about 35% of the revenues come from, flow from various government agencies. But last and certainly not least, paid contractors, and most particularly, uh, paid defense contractors. I refer to this as the deep state, but as the deep contractor uh, state. And the real question for me is whether the Trump administration has yet done anything to grow, rein in, or otherwise affect the size, the scope of this uh, deep contractor state, most especially with respect to um, defense contractors. Now to get an idea of how big this is, just so you have this least one uh, image in your heads, if you got rid of the entire federal civilian workforce, I mean, everybody, everybody, about 200, and there you go. That's a two point, give me the next one. Give me the next one. That's a 2.5 trillion. I should just quit while I'm ahead, right? <laughs> Stick with this one. <laughs> this is good, this is good. Um, if you get rid of the entire federal civilian workforce, it's $250 billion, okay? In a single year, over $300 billion goes out to defense contractors alone, okay? Okay, it's bigger than the entire, everything we spend, excluding postal workers, on the federal uh, civilian workforce. So, Lee. You know what, Lee? There it is. I'll tell you what. I have, really, I, if you, if you, if if you hit, for future presenters, if you touch this, it, 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 it quits the th slide. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate that. When I come back in another life, I'll remember that. Um, Technology is different. In any case, uh, this is a big deal, and the bottom line is that I don't believe, and I can give you other uh, facts and fun figures, but the bottom line is the contractor state, the proxy state, has grown and grown and grown. It's never been bigger than it is now, with $1.3 trillion in the budget, and uh, no end in sight to uh, the other big fact about American government, that it is deficit budgeted and, and uh, debt financed. I don't see this ending under Trump. If anything, I see it getting worse at a faster pace than it has over the past 15 years. Uh, but that remains to be seen. So, thank you very much. I'm, I'm now afraid to touch this thing. <laughs> yeah, if they, ignore the curtain, <laughs> curtain behind me. It's a, it's a real honor uh, to be here. I want to thank the tribunal on the first row for in, inviting me and uh, to be on this distinguished panel. Uh, I. I I fear, though, after all these really sober and engaging presentations, that I'm going to sound a bit like a, a Cassandra. Um, um, be, because, but I'm going to leave it to, to Ken to work out the differences between what I have to say and, and the rest of my, pa uh, my fellow panelists. So I think the significance and dangers of Donald Trump's presidency are captured well by his boast at the Republican National Convention. I alone can fix it. Uh, it, it um, and it may be that if you look at um, the chaos in, in the West Wing and the dearth of legislative achievements that Francis talks about, uh, it, it may be that, or it, 
that there never has been uh, such dramatic uh, validation of Theodore Lowy's refrain uh, that the modern presidency is trapped in an intractable dynamic of power invested and promise unfulfilled. Um, yet, I think what's often overlooked in looking at the chaos and the dearth of legislation um, and the disappointments and recriminations of Trump's frenzied beginning uh, is the, his aggressive and deliberate uh, assault on the liberal state. Uh, since day one, in fact, uh, Trump has forcefully and sometimes successfully taken aim at the programmatic achievements of his predecessor. And I detail um, all uh, these actions in my memo, and which is drawn from a longer piece that appeared in, in, in the forum. I can only speak in broader skeletal terms here. Um, in an effort, as one of Trump's supporters put it, uh, to erase Obama's legacy, the, the president has issued a blizzard of executive initiatives that have refashioned or seriously disrupted government commitments in critical policy arenas such as immigration, climate change, foreign trade, criminal justice, civil rights, education, and healthcare policy. Uh, furthermore, Trump appointed a Supreme Court Justice, Neil Gorsuch, uh, who in, in combination with the obstructive ta tactics of the Senate, Republicans that denied Merrick Garland, remember that guy, <laughs> Merrick Garland, uh, a seat on the bench. Uh, this appointment of Gorsuch and the denial of uh, Garland confirms the Robert, Roberts Court acceptance of executive action uh, that advances conservative policy such as, uh, in, in areas such as national security, protection of the homeland, policing, and civil rights. There are a lot of features, of course, of, of Trump's shocking rise to the White House and the tumultuous uh, beginning of his presidency that represent moral features in American politics. But the administrative aggrandizement that so far has dominated his time in office, I think marks the continuation of a far-reaching development in American politics. The rise of an executive-centered partisanship, which is a, a, a de development I've been trying to figure out for like three decades. Um, that is, and by that I mean the isolating, but dominating place that presidents uh, occupy in the current uh, wars between liberals and conservatives, where parties rely on presidential candidates and presidents to pronounce party doctrine, to raise campaign funds, to campaign on behalf of their partisan brethren, to mobilize grassroots support, and to advance party programs. The original credo of the modern executive held that presidents had the responsibility to be, as Theodore Roosevelt put it in an alluring, in an alluring phrase, the steward of the public welfare, to rise above partisan squabbles that, that dominated the end of the 19th century, to rise above a party system that was localized and Congress-centered, and leaven the welfare and national security states, consolidated the, the, during the New Deal, with what Franklin Roosevelt called in his uh, Commonwealth Club address, enlightened administration. Now, this hope for an elevated form of pragmatism, as, as we saw, in the, as we heard in the first panel, never fully materialized. As Bruf Miroff puts it in thinking about John F. Kennedy's presidency, which was the height of this commitment to a kind of elevated pragmatism, there was a, this, this was really a pragmatic illusion. Nevertheless, from the end of the Second World War to the late 1970s, pol party politics was subordinated to what Karen Oren and Stephen Skorana call a policy state, where party conflict uh, and, um, uh, and was, was largely displaced by a new understanding of rights, a new understanding of the Constitution, and the delivery of service, services associated with those rights. However, recent institutional developments and changes in the dynamic of partisanship have encouraged the White House to form direct ties with social movement organizations and advocacy groups and to deploy executive power in the service of partisan objectives. Republican presidents, especially uh, Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, 
pioneered the art of mobilizing partisan opinion and exploiting administrative power for partisan objectives. They forged close ties with the Christian right, a movement which anticipated and has collaborated with the Tea Party movement, the movement that has been cultivated by every Republican presidential candidate since 2012. During his, his campaign, of course, uh, Barack Obama presented himself as a, transcend, a transcendent leader who would imbue the policy state with new causes and new moral fervor. But by the time he reached office, it no longer seemed possible for presidents to stand apart from partisan combat. Partisan polarization had come to so divide Congress and advocacy groups in Washington that the Obama administration had strong incentives, especially after the disastrous 2010 elections, to take refuge in partisan administration. And Obama used his pioneering uh, presidential movement, as he called it, organizing for action, to join his executive actions to, uh, to a largely, to a scattered but potentially powerful new progressive coalition, sometimes called the Coalition of the Ascendant. Millennials, minorities, the LGBTQ uh, Q community, uh, and, uh, and uh, educated uh, white professionals, especially single women. So far did Obama push the administrative envelope after Republicans assumed command of the House in the 2010 elections that GOP strategists eagerly anticipated uh, that the next Republican president would seize the loaded administrative weapon that Obama had left in the Oval Office. Uh, Obama's resort to administrative action to advance his objectives, most controversially uh, in immigration policy, is understandable from a political point of view. But it did help to clear the path for Trump's more aggressive partisan administration. Now, one might think an aggressive administrative strategy would not have been so pivotal uh, for the GO after the GOP won control of the Senate in 2014 and began this current Republican administration under unified government in 2017. Nevertheless, given that so much of Obama's record could be undone unilaterally, and given that Trump's had a determination to circumvent the tensions in the, uh, among congressional Republicans on issues like immigration and trade, it's not surprising that Trump resorted to administrative aggrandizement right from the start, often in the service of highly controversial measures that strained his relations with congressional Republicans who remain split in the areas of free trade and immigration. Now, Trump's estrangement uh, with some of the GOP establishment on issues, um, such, on these kind of issues, such as immigration uh, and trade, uh, I think has resulted in some striking evidence of how presidents dominate their party's brand, uh, as some of my graduate students like to refer to parties. Um, how they can denigrate parties as collective organizations with a past and a future. Although Trump's harsh positions on immigration, trade, and national security might not have won over Republicans in Washington, he has formed strong ties with the Republicans' base through tweets, mass rallies, and administrative action. And a March uh, NBC News Wall Street poll found that 59% of registered Republican voters considered themselves more a supporter of Trump than the Republican Party. And further confirming the, exec the executive-centered character of contemporary partisanship, a Quinnipiac University, I, th I think that's the way you say that. Quinnipiac, is that right? Quinnipiac. Oh, okay, I'll, do, I'll try it, I'll, I'll work on it later. <laughs> I only got a minute left, <laughs> I'll worry later, Sid. A Quinnipiac uh, uh, poll, um, uh, uh, um, we're, now I lost my place. <laughs> uh, also, uh, Quinnipiac poll, also taken in March, excuse me, revealed that 58% of Republican voters supported imposing tariffs 
on steel and aluminum. And that was a powerful example of how Trump had transformed Republican loyalist positions on trade policy during the 2016 campaign. During the election year, Pew tracked, uh, Pew, the Pew Foundation tracked a massive drop in the share of Republicans. <laughs> I, got, I see the stop sign, I'll stop in a minute. Uh, in, in, in a massive drop in the, in the views of Republicans and Republican leaning independents saying that free trade agreements had been a good thing for the United States. That drop is, is as follows. From 56% who supported free trade in early 2015 to 29% in October of, 20, uh, of 2016. Um, uh, did I say early 2016? I meant early 2015, excuse me. I'm so nervous following the Julio there. You know, he's such a, <laughs> such a great comedian. So let me finish with this. There's, there's more to say, but I'm gonna, I, I don't want to take up Ken's time. Uh, Obama uh, positioned himself, and this points, I think, to this third way question. Obama positioned himself uh, as the leader of a, of, as a pro progressive, a coalition of the ascendants. Trump uh, has, uh, has uh, established himself, along with uh, the support of in important strategists, as the leader of a coalition of restoration uh, comprised of blue collar, religiously devout, and non-urban -ur whites who feel that major demographic shifts and, and major uh, changes in social policy have created a state to which they no longer feel allegiance. And the answer uh, to that question has been to strengthen the development of a competing conservative state uh, that really goes back to Richard Nixon, but has been advanced importantly by Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, and now Donald Trump. In a sense, one could see uh, Trump's conservatism as being uh, a kind of, I know I got, now I got two stops, uh, as being a, a kind of uh, uh, extension of the, the Reagan revolution, but without the idealism of a city on a hill. So thank you very much. Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be a, a commenter on, on this set of memos. They were quite provocative and, and, and very insightful in a lot of ways for helping us to think about the different institutions within the American state and how they're relating to the, the Trump presidency uh, and really putting on, the, on you know, the, the agenda for discussion, the whole question about the institutional checks and balances and the separation of powers. Uh, what has stayed the same and what has changed in American politics. So I learned a lot by reading these papers. I should point out the way we've got this set up with the panels is we've, we've got papers by specialists in American politics looking at the, the different issues uh, that we're grappling with. And then we have commentators who are comparativists uh, that are trying to bring in insights from other parts of the world and to try to, try to reflect upon what we're learning about, about the United States. So let me say, a, a few words about this as, as a comparativist. As I read through the papers, I found myself thinking back uh, to democratic theory and you know, some of the theoretical origins of thinking about the separation of powers and checks and balances. And it, you know, in thinking about this, it reminded me that the great theorists of, of checks and balances really wrote before the rise of modern political parties. Um, and so they wrote in contexts where you could create separate institutions um, and the, the expectation was that those institutions would, would function autonomously or independently of each other um, and that they would serve as checks and balances against each other. Um, and what's striking when you look at the comparative, the comparative record in the places that we alluded to in the first panel, places that have gone through some process of democratic backsliding or democratic erosion, there is a uh, kind of a common logic that you see to it. And the role of political parties, I think, have been a very important part of that. Um, Didi Quo referred to sort of a common template uh, in her comments in the first panel. And let me just say a few words about that common template, because I think it's, it's illustrative in many ways. Uh, typically, the common template starts by fusing together executive and legislative powers and using partisanship to do that. All right, so yes, there is the rise of a dominant, often some sort of populist autocratic outsider figure, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Viktor Orban, 
little bit different in, in the Hungarian case, uh, but they don't, they don't act on their own, right? They're not, they're not independent figures. Even somebody like Rafael Correa in Ecuador, who was elected on his own, quickly constructed a political party to, to control the institutions and to help him in the process of fusing together executive and legislative powers and using partisanship to do that. Once you do that, that particular fusion, there's a quick progression towards trying to neutralize the courts uh, and ultimately to subordinate the courts using the appointment powers of the executive and legislative branches to try to subordinate the courts and to pack the courts. Uh, it moves from there oftentimes uh, to some sort of effort to, to, to censor or to, to monitor or to at least you know, self-censor the media. In the US case, is a little bit different, very difficult, obviously, to censor the media in the United States. But efforts to discredit opposition media, you see the politicization of the media and, uh, and sort of the, the construction of these rival media empires that are clearly attached to certain understandings of American politics and the tendency for so many people to listen to one side or the other. All right, but you're moving then uh, from the executive and legislative branches to the courts, to the media, and then oftentimes what comes after that is tinkering with the electoral machinery, right? Different ways in which you manipulate the electoral process, whether it's the right to vote, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's districts, whether uh, the various other ways, whether it's the, the actual machinery, the institutions that count the votes. Um, and ultimately there are different pieces of this template that tends to be shared in common in the places where we've seen uh, serious democratic erosion or backsliding. Now, when I look at, at, at the papers that, uh, the short memos that are part of this panel, in some ways it's reassuring to me because it, it drives home how difficult it is to do that template in the United States. And a couple of things that, that make it more difficult, all right, for all the Republican talk about, about the deep state, what you realize in, you know, in, in reading the, you know, John's paper is how much of the state has been subcontracted out. And, you know, there's sort of, you know, the, the state's not, not, not what it could be otherwise. Um, and certainly in Francis's paper, she, she talks about the role of the Congress and the independence of it, uh, the fact that it does not simply subordinate itself, uh, even within the Republican Party, uh, to, the, to the Trump administration. And so you see in many, in many ways, the, the, uh, the lack of discipline in the American political parties and the fact that Donald Trump does not count upon a disciplined Republican Party the way Urban might in Hungary or Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela. And so yes, they have partisan allies in the United States, but you don't have the kinds of centralized party discipline that necessarily ensures that they will do your bidding. And so, so it allows for uh, you know, for a greater resiliency, I think, of the checks and balances in the U.S. case. The other thing that really jumps out, of course, is simply that the Democratic, Trump comes to a power in a context where the Democratic Party has, has not collapsed or has not suffered a, an existential crisis of some sort. That is often the context where you get the rise of an Hugo Chavez or a Viktor Urban in, in Hungary. The Socialist Party you know, was dramatically weakened by their mishandling of an economic crisis in 2008, 2009. Venezuela, basically the old part of the strongest party system in Latin America, self-destructed in the 1990s. They create a political vacuum that it makes it easier for some sort of populist autocrat to emerge, concentrate power, create partisan followers that can then occupy those different institutional niches and begin to whittle away at the checks and balances through the courts, through the electoral machinery uh, and, and the other institutions. And so I think that the papers we see here help us understand how difficult it is to do that in the United States. And, and in, in some ways I find it reassuring, but in other ways, you know, and I think in, in a lot of respects, um, you know, Sydney's pa paper helped to, to think through the different ways in which you see, um, in, in which uh, uh, the, the, you see the, the Republican Party being transformed at the grassroots. And, uh, and, it, and, and what I'm led to ask, I think, is whether or not, the, whose political party is this? To what extent is the party becoming Donald Trump's political party? I was struck, I mean, yesterday as I got ready to come here and I was reading Francis's paper and I was, in some ways I was feeling 
reassured, and then I hear that I hear, all right, uh, you know, Paul Ryan is, is leaving, and then I turn on the news at night expecting to hear about Paul Ryan, and I'm hearing about Steve Bannon coming back. <laughs> and I say, wow, you know, what, whose political party really is this, and what does that mean? And the kinds of administrative aggrandizement that, that Sidney was talking about, you certainly see the different ways in, in which that is, is taking place. Um, I'm also struck, you know, in, in Francis's paper, she, she talked a lot about, uh, you know, some of the dissent that has been open within the Republican Party to the Trump administration, and, and we can, you know, there's Jeff Flake, there's Corker, there's been McCain, uh, but what's striking, of course, is these are not the guys who are running for re-election, um, and so you're finding those Republicans who are not having to face the Republican electorate uh, with the threat of primary challenges, uh, and so you're finding a willingness to assert some independence and to maintain the resiliency of some of the checks and balances. But I worry uh, about those that are remaining uh, in, the, the Democratic, uh, in the Democratic contest and the extent to which they're willing uh, to assert some independence. Um, and so ultimately, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm a somewhat reassured in, in reading the papers because it does drive home how different the U.S. is from cases like Hungary or Venezuela or other places where you do see severe uh, democratic backsliding. Uh, and yet at the same time, what I worry about are the trend lines. Um, where is this going? Uh, and in particular, uh, you know, the nature of the transformations within the party system. Uh, Sydney talked about the sort of the strengthening at the grassroots, the uh, sort of the transformation of the parties from the bottom up. I mean, I think in the Republican Party, you get this strange, sort of an unusual combination of bottom-up mobilization through the Tea Party and a transformation at the grassroots of the party, at the same time as a very new, different kind of leadership emerging, uh, sort of a populist outsider type <coughs> leadership from the top down with, with Trump. And so it's the, the combination of the bottom-up transformation and the top down. Uh, and what that says about the trend lines, that's what I find most worrisome. But also just to conclude, clearly when I, when I look at these comparative cases that have had the severe democratic erosion, the role of political parties in that process has been vital, all right? Because these figures, the, the populist autocrats cannot function on their own. Uh, and my sense is that if, if the Republican Party becomes convinced that Trump is a serious electoral liability, uh, you could certainly envision much more dissent along the lines of what, what Francis is talking about. My sense is that the party has, there's not yet an internal calculation that he's that kind of, of liability, it's certainly within the ranks of the party um, to where you're seeing much um, expression of, of independence on the part of the, the Republican officials. I think I better stop there before I take too much time. Thank you. All right, we've got 19 minutes for questions, so uh, concise questions, please. Um, Adam Scheingate. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, great uh, talk from the panel. I'm very excited to see you know, Americanists and, and uh, comparativists together. Um, I think the two panels also um, underscore the striking differences in perspectives between comparativists and Americanists. So the comparativists uh, in the room and in, and in other writings have talked about their similarities or uh, worrying um, uh, uh, resemblance between what's happening in the United States now and, and democratic backsliding around uh, in other cases or uh, similarities with illiberal or hybrid or uh, minimally democratic regimes. And then Americanists, as, as I think we heard just now, tend to emphasize uh, continuities uh, and trends uh, in some ways that may come out of a, a view of separation of powers that it was built for uh, resilience, not efficiency, and, and so it's, it has these redundancies. And if there's a worrying tendency, as, as I think people noticed, it's uh, with polarization, it's, it's moving towards uh, profound institutional dysfunction. So my question for the panelists is, um, is the United States too ungovernable to become autocratic? Yes. I need a call of us for this. I mean, I think, I think that's actually an important point, right? I mean, I think part of what, it, and, and this point about parties and part of what um, leads to some democratic backsliding is the total collapse of some of the alternative uh, sources of power within the system. Um, and, and part of what's important about this present moment in the American system is 
you do have this outsider candidate with few ties um, to the establishment who, who is quite successful in lots of ways, um, but there's still lots of other sources of power within the system, um, and they have lots of ability and interest to push back, um, and they are pushing back. Peter? Nobody talked about the huge wave of um, super majorities and uh, triple uh, branch takeovers in the U.S. states and over the last eight years, and that makes an enormous difference in the way in which things function, for example, in Congress. Um, and I think Francis laid out a perspective that suggests acquiescence on the part of Republicans as long as they could shove through long-standing agendas, not necessarily evidence yet that they'll stand up to anything. But quickly, De Julio, I, I, have, I, I have one question. I want to see that graph on contractors, <laughs> not again right now, but at the next iteration, I want to see what proportion of the contracts are going to personal friends and kin. Well, in South Philly, half of them. Of, uh, and I, I would expect you to get at that, and it's a serious question because the one comparative perspective that nobody's brought to bear here is to patronage states, to, you know, predator capitalist regimes. And if there's one thing that Trump re and his cronies throughout the federal bureaucracy seem to be trying to do, it's to redirect that federal largesse to particular companies. That's a challenge to the understanding of democratic capitalism that has evolved in the West and in the United States in the mid-20th century, in which there's some degree of consistency. Uh, so. You got it. Okay. There's a lot more soul sourcing than people realize. I mean, one of the trick parts, one of the backstories there is the role of the changes that were supposed to make it more competitive that goes on the back end. There's a lot more soul sourcing. And, you know, in the federal procurement process, it's really difficult to anybody out who has a, at least one friend in Congress. So uh, you're the guy who probably asked for it. So get the beef there in there next time. I'm coming to you. <laughs> you're going to have to help me do it. I got it. I got it. So Francis, do you want to talk about that too? Uh, on the point about the, uh, the Republican strength in the federal system we're extending well beyond Congress. That, I mean, it is remarkable the high watermark that Republicans uh, enjoyed in uh, after the 2016 elections. But a great part of the story of that was a series of backlashes against uh, uh, um, uh, the Obama administration over two terms. We saw a similar pattern under George W. Bush, where Republicans were in very poor shape uh, at the time Obama was elected, both in the states and, of course, in Congress with a 60-vote Democrats with their six, brief 60-vote margin uh, in, the, in the Senate, so, or 60 votes uh, uh, that, they, that they held. And I, I think, you know, w one of the things that, that uh, is really interesting as an operation of the federal system, or, you know, as the presidency has become so central to defining partisanship, is this, the, the potency of the, pres the backlash, that the, the backlash against the president is, is the driving force in all these state legislative elections. That, um, it, I mean, so many Republicans lost their seats in, uh, uh, in, in the wake of the Iraq War in state legislatures, having had nothing to do with the Iraq War. And it's the same, same pattern that we saw with the Democratic wipeout um, under Obama. It, it, neither party has the confidence of the American people. And so when it captures the presidency, it suffers this huge backlash. And, and in thinking about Republican acquiescence, uh, Republican acquiescence, I think, as we reflect back, on the, um, uh, on the Trump presidency will have been at its peak in 2017 um, because the 2018 elections are going to clip the president's wings. They are, regardless of whether uh, the Democrats actually retake control of the House, there will be loss of seats and therefore blame of Trump for having loss of, ha those, those, those seat losses. And so Republicans, we, we have elections very frequently in the U.S. And, uh, and, uh, and so power just doesn't last long. No? 
Francis's last comment helped me to crystallize what I was going to say, but not very clearly. Maybe it's still not very clear. But from Sydney's uh, paper, the other Sydney, uh, uh, it, 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 it seems clear to me that we're not just looking at a Republican base in a traditional sense. We're looking at what Doug McAdam, in his book, Deeply Divided, calls the movementalization of the Republican base. These are people who support Trumpism in a way that goes beyond policy initiatives. And, and the fact that they have shifted so sharply on such issues as tariffs um, um, makes me wonder uh, just how much the Republican elite is going to shift even when they lose out as they certainly will to at least some extent in 2018. So what, what I worry about uh, and, and is, is not a Venezuelan or a Hungarian outcome. What I worry about is an Italian outcome. And the Italy I'm thinking of is the Italy of 1922, where a relative outsider with no institutional political experience managed to capitalize on the ungovernability of Italian society to take power and to use the institutions of power in order to do away with democracy. I would, I would say uh, quickly in, in response to que Ken's question about what are parties now in the United States, they are, and this doesn't begin with Trump, although he's brought it to an extreme, they're this kind of fascinating top-down, bottom-up, uh, forms of mobilization uh, that, uh, that uh, connects, uh, or the White House seeks to connect uh, directly with social movement, and presidential candidates as well, with, with social movement organizations and, and, and advocacy groups. And, and I think uh, before we have faith in the Republicans uh, writing off Trump, we'll have to, because I think they're scared to death of the base, we'll have to, we'll have to see some guys who are not uh, who are going to run next time, who, who, who are not retiring, stand up to Trump. Maybe Speaker Ryan will do that. But I also think an, uh, another thing we haven't talked about, Theda, is, is the mobilization on the left. And it'll be really interesting to follow this kind of social democratic, or democratic socialist trend on the left begun by Bernie Sanders and how that, that competition uh, between this kind of uh, n uh, authoritarian nationalism and, and a ver an American version of uh, democratic socialism will play out over the next uh, a couple of election cycles. Well, one question I have is the extent to which the the the, the, the Trump that Trump represents a movement, as opposed he's a celebrity with that has he's connected with the Republican base on the on on the basis of his rhetoric and who he is, but it's 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 a personal franchise, and it, it doesn't seem to translate to Republican congressional candidates. Very much an open question whether the Trump voter will turn out in 2018, and so you can you you're faced with a situation where you know Trump Trump himself is this populist leader, but it's not clear that he can translate that into sufficient institutional power. Des King, thanks very much. Thank you for the panel. It was terrific. Um, several years ago. Rob Lieberman and Gretchen and myself edited a book called um, Democratization in America, which was meant to try and apply democratization theory to the US. Uh, it sold fewer copies than there are people in this room, so it was a huge success. Um, nonetheless, in that volume were some interesting papers about historical trends in rolling back, which I think we might want to spend more time on. Um, rather than thinking about it as a phenomenon. At the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, American democratization reversed in many ways. Re comparatively, a very interesting experience. Um, and one I think that is relevant to today. And of course, it was about racial divisions. And racial divisions, as I'll say tomorrow, are probably much more central, I think, to the, to the debates than have uh, yet been mentioned um, in the way in which Trump organized his campaign and subsequently has, has mobilized around that issue. The book did get one interesting review by Stepan and Lentz in Perspectives and Politics, in which they focused on the institutional veto points in the US compared to other countries. And that is an interesting article in itself, uh, which I think is highly relevant and fits in with what I thought were Ken's really interesting comments about the problem of applying a template of democratization theory to the US. I think it is immensely complicated. And that's one of the challenges for the five authors to sort out in their, um, in their book. <laughs>
Tom, you had your hand up? Yeah, so I wanted to follow up with Francis on the, on the point that uh, you know, Mr. Kenley just made about him having to rehearse for a litany and things and whatnot. And so, I mean, when he describes it in the response to his question, that's because he's one of the people who's a celebrity. And I think that's right. But I also think that he is also an articulation of a policy position that was not as simply on his report, but he is an executive. So what, what I interpret Paul Barrett and your information to be is sort of an example of Placement of one type of Republican, one type of Republican with another type of Republican. So the, so the the principled or not the libertarian or conservative or free trader or market oriented Republican with one which is more likely to be a grifter or a xenophobe, right? And so Trump is functional for that constituency, and that constituency constituency does exist. It's not purely a Republican constituency, but could this represent as a? Uh, could he represent, even if he's not in and of himself, the vanguard of a new Trump party, the uh, facilitating condition for the emergence of a new type of Republican party that is more ideologically coherent, but just around a different thing than it had been previously? I mean, there's no question that Trump is the most popular Republican leader among Republicans, and that is very dangerous politically for a Republican to take on Trump directly. That's why the, the ways in which Congress has checked the president have been tacit. They don't do it in, openly, but they've checked him quietly. So that, and so that does point to transformation, that Trump, Trump is the leader of the Republican Party. But the, Trump is also a very unpopular president. And so what we're looking at, you know, with, you know, to elections every two years, hard to believe we're at elections again. Um, but after these next elections, the Republican power will be diminished. So, so, so President Trump will be in better control of a smaller Republican Party. I would just add, like to add um, that I don't think um, uh, Trump is merely a celebrity without strong connections uh, to social movements. You know, I've studied this pretty carefully as strong relations with the Christian right. Uh, just look at a lot of his executive orders. They could have been written by leaders uh, of the oh, Christian right. And, and he also has a really strong relationship with the, with the Tea Party. Uh, and those two groups collaborate with each other. So there is, and, and then there are these new alt-right groups that, that are very important. And, and I, I live in Charlottesville, so I know just, just how important they are. Uh, so I, I don't disagree that this only represents about 40% of the electorate. But when you talk about primaries, this is going to have, a, I think, an enduring effect on the Republican Party. It's a lean, mean Republican yeah, Party. Yeah, and, it, and, I'll, and it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how the Democrats ultimately react to it. Hey, uh, uh, Ken is right also that dissent will increase after, uh, after uh, Trump proves to be a, a political liability to, uh, to Republicans. That is going, that will happen. It happen it's, it, that's, that to, that's just routine. Midterm elections work this way, and they, they create dissent in the president's party. Um, so we can, we can expect that after 2018. Sorry, just a follow-up on that. This is James Atkin from The Economist. So, so that's in contradiction with what you say about him being in more control of a smaller party, which is right, that he'll be more, in more control after midterms as the Republican Party shrinks, or that he will be in less control because he will face more dissent. I mean, with the replacement of, of uh, Ryan with a, uh, the next speaker, if, next speaker if, it, if he is a Republican, will be more closely aligned with Trump than, than Ryan was. Um, so so in, that, in that respect. But if they're, if, if they, if they're diminished in, uh, in, in numbers sufficient to lose control, there will be, Trump will be blamed. And then there's a question of how that plays out in the conservative uh, media. How much of this will be laid at the president's feet? I think a lot. There'll be a lot of criticism of the president's management style. All these things, uh, all these sources of discontent, discontent that are present, all those will be voiced, and they'll they'll center on Trump. It may be that the party is more ideologically unified around Trumpist thinking, but they, the dissatisfaction with Trump as leader will grow. Um, should should uh, he he prove to bring down many Republican uh, electoral fortunes?
it's true that many of the many of the folks, most Republicans, most discontented with Trump, will be the first casualties in the midterm. But there will be Republicans in Congress who are currently committee chairs who will not be committee chairs, and they will blame Trump for that um, if they lose the, if they lose the majority. And so, so you, you can't escape accountability to the to your fellow partisans in Congress if you in the in the wake of a large loss of seats. And there's internal presidential aspirants within the Republican Party. They're clearly sort of biding their time to some degree. People like Ben Sass and Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, who all are trying to figure out how do they maintain their own viability as future potential presidential candidates without completely pissing off the Trump voters in the meantime, right? And, and I think if the Republican uh, political fortune sour a little bit, it creates more space for them to distance themselves more and more um, and eat away, eat away at Trump while they try to position themselves um, as the eventual successor of Trump. And if you have one of those guys as a successor of Trump, it's not gonna look like a very Trumpian party um, eight years from now, right? <laughs> It's a good, no, I think it's a general question, though. We've got a hand up over here. Rick? Yeah. Well, it's incredibly reassuring to listen to you say this. And so, uh, and, um, and, and to that, and that, you know, I, I think often about the implications of the 2018 elections. And so you've sketched one possible scenario of what happens in the aftermath of the 2018 elections, but there's another possible aftermath, which is in Juan Linz's article, The Perils of Presidentialism, which is that there is the showdown that Sam Huntington talked about uh, a long time ago in this uh, famous article that the conference at Maryland was all about, which was, which was that the, the president will simply try to shut down Congress. That is to say that, the, that um, that if they're, if, I mean, your point about the Democrats being important and how they handle the, the aftermath is a, absolutely critical, but if, if they impeach the president, that's exactly what the president wants. <coughs> and that, I, I, at that point, the Trumpification of the Republican Party is gonna go into overdrive. I mean, this gets pretty speculative, but no, as I- No, I agree. <laughs> yeah, but as I play it out, I think that, that Democratic victories in 2018, if they are sufficiently large, will play out in a way that's beneficial to Trump winning re-election. Because you know, an impeachment showdown, I think, w will redound to his benefit in the same way that the impeachment showdown helped President Clinton. So, uh, so I, I, I mean, thinking about the politics of impeachment, uh, you have to look to the Senate. And that means Trump would need to lose support of Republicans the Senate, the Senate, major, Senate majority will not change much. Uh, he would need, there would need to be Republicans to support impeachment. And many Democrats in the Senate represent uh, Trump states. And uh, assuming that they survive the 2018 elections, they, they, they will still hesitate to pull the trigger on, on impeachment. So I think it would be very much the same story that played out 1997, 98, um, where if if the House goes forward with impeachment, it comes to an end in the Senate and winds up helping the President. Um, I'm old enough to remember George W. Bush's uh, uh, two, two terms. And in you know, 2004, 2005, there was great astonishment, uh, especially on the left, that he managed to have such tremendous support among the evangelical and Republican base, despite you know, the, the Iraq War. And it all collapsed, if you go back and you look at the polling, it all collapsed uh, between the time that the, uh, he lost the Social Security privatization uh, fight and Katrina. And the, the reputation that he got was of incompetence, of just not running the government right. And support among Republicans just collapsed. And so my question is, are we, you know, we're only 15 months into the Trump administration, you know, the economy's still okay, we haven't started, he hasn't started any wars, um, nothing really has gone wrong that is palpable for the average person or the, I mean, it's scary for a lot of people, and there's controversy and there's corruption, 
but it, you know, there's not bodies floating in the water, uh, <laughs> right? It, it's it's we don't we don't have um, we don't have well, yeah, Puerto Rico, but uh, yeah, good point. But um, uh, they should be a state, by the way. Uh, so I'm, I'm, my question is, how much does actual governing and the effects of governing factor into the um, the larger democ democratic resilience and capacity to for the for the system to readjust? That, I mean, that's a that's a really good question. Sometimes I think you know no, nothing matters. <laughs> It takes what 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 does it take to get through to voters? I mean, uh, uh, I mean the the, the most uh, potent sorts of failures to bring down presidential approval ratings are uh, wars gone badly, which of course that happened in the, the uh, George W. Bush administration, and economic crises. And so, in the absence of that, what gets through to people? Uh, you know mismanagement of agencies, that, that would only be understood by those who are affected by it and are able to, 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 tra to, to trace it. Uh, I think if there is significant intra-party criticism of the president's management, which I think is possible a a in the wake of uh, the 2018 elections, that I think would have purchase with Republican voters and might undercut the president's reputation as a manager. We have... Go ahead. Did you want to? No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, your, your question is, has, uh, suggests a puzzle I've been struggling with that is, in some ways, one could see Trump as snatching defeat from, from the jaws of victory because the economy had, and had, was doing well uh, <laughs> and uh, their consumer confidence is higher than it's been in, in a couple of, of decades. Uh, but he keeps uh, the, the pl political system churning with, with th things related to nativism. Uh, and, and civil rights uh, uh, and tariffs uh, that constantly, that, that threaten to really disrupt this record of, of governance. And why? <laughs> why? Why does he do that? Is he simply a cult of personality? And if he's, if he's impeached and, and we get Pence, everything will go back to a kind of reassuring equilibrium? Or is there a certain dynamic, a trend in, in American politics now, uh, a kind of uh, 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 roiling of, a, of a, a competing visions of the state about what it means to, um, to, to be an American that, and to, that really uh, looks back to some of these periods that were talked about in the first panel that's going to continue uh, for, for some time. Yeah. I'm Perry. I'm from 538. Um, I guess the question, Francis made a comment to me think about this. Does in the idea of impeachment not really for the president doing bad things and not really work in a context in which um, we have sort of two tribal parties where we have them now? Does that mechanism not really work if all impeachments die unless there are, you know, 80 senators of one party? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the constitutional requirement. And, in a, and in, a, in a political system where the two parties are so evenly matched, it means that the, 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 that the president has to lose substantial amount of support from within his own party. Uh, and so w w what of the pending controversies is ha has enough potency to destabilize that support? It's worth noting, right? It's, it's always been relatively easy to impeach a president, right? It's extraordinarily difficult to remove a president in the Senate, and that requires almost always some significant bipartisan support, right? And so. It's, it's hard to get any bipartisan support for anything right now because the parties are so polarized. But, but you can imagine circumstances under which you, have, you can get that kind of bipartisan support. But it does mean that if you, want to avoid, if you want to avoid the Clinton scenario and you're a Democratic House member, you've got to build the kind of public support that ultimately is going to pull over some Republican senators when it gets to the Senate before you pull the trigger on actually impeaching. And I think part of the Republican mistake with Clinton in the House was not thinking very hard about that next step and sort of assuming it will all come along, right, when it clearly didn't. And the Democrats may find themselves making the same mistake um, with Trump if they're not careful. All right, it's almost time for EJDL. Let's thank our panelists.